This is going to be a brief video on antipsychotics, drugs that are also called neuroleptics. And before we begin, there's an image here that's an old advertisement for Thorazine, which is an antipsychotic, a first generation antipsychotic, back when psychosis had a stigma of violent outbursts. So let's start with first generation antipsychotics like Thorazine. First generation antipsychotics are also called typical antipsychotics. This group consists of drugs that end in azine, A-Z-I-N-E, -E, as well as haloperidol. The highly potent first generation antipsychotics are haloperidol, trifluoperazine, and flufenazine. The medium potency first generation antipsychotics are perfenazine, and the low potency first generation antipsychotics are chlorpromazine and theoridazine. The mechanism of action for these are that they have a high affinity for the D2 dopamine receptor, and they antagonize that receptor, meaning that they inhibit dopamine from hitting that receptor. This in turn leads to an increase in norepinephrine because dopamine and norepinephrine are kind of in balance with each other, and high norepinephrine increases the concentration of cyclic AMP. Some indications for using first-generation antipsychotics are schizophrenia, of course, specifically the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, like the delusions. Um, also, all the diseases that go under that schizophrenia umbrella, including brief psychotic disorder, schizophreniform disorder, and also schizoaffective disorder. There's other psychoses that you would use first-generation antipsychotics for, delirium, Tourette's, and Huntington's as well, but mainly schizophrenia and other psychoses. Some side effects of these typical antipsychotics are that they delay cardiac conduction. This is a side effect common to both first and second gen uh, antipsychotics. They delay cardiac conduction by prolonging the QT interval, which puts you at risk for torsades, which can eventually progress to VTAC and then VFib. So that's, that's a pretty dangerous side effect. The first generation antipsychotics also have anticholinergic effects. This includes blurred vision, constipation, dry mouth, and urinary retention. Um, if you think about a parasympathetic versus sympathetic reaction, these all align with the sympathetic reaction, the fight or flight. And that makes sense because acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter involved in parasympathetic reactions. So if you have anticholinergic effects, they're going to be sympathetic, like blurred vision, constipation, dry mouth, urinary retention, which are all fight or flight rather than rest and digest. These anticholinergic effects are worse with lower potency antipsychotics. So uh, a high potency antipsychotic like haloperidol will have milder anticholinergic effects. There's an inverse relationship between the potency of the anticholinergic effects and the potency of the antipsychotic. So haloperidol is a strong antipsychotic, a high potent antipsychotic, and it has milder anticholinergic effects. <clears throat> These typical antipsychotics also have an antihistamine effect, like sedation. Um, that's like typical in, in like Benadryl as well, an antihistamine that gets into your brain causes sedation. They also have anti-alpha-1 receptor effects, which uh, is like orthostatic hypertension, causes vasodilation and orthostatic hypertension. They have some endocrine side effects, like hypoprolactemia, and a list of other endocrine-related um, so side effects that would result from hyperprolactemia. This is caused by the D2 blockade of the tuberoinfundibular pathway. And then there are extrapyramidal symptoms. There are extrapyramidal symptoms and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. We're going to be talking about those in greater detail in the next couple slides. So extrapyramidal symptoms. These are caused by D2 blockage of the negrostriatal pathway. Now these kind of progress differently depending on the time course. Uh, within a few hours to days, you might get an acute dystonic reaction, uh, which is sustained muscle contractions. You can treat this with diphenhydramine or benztropine, which is an anti-muscarinic drug. So that's an acute dystonic reaction. It just means muscle contractions that you cannot control. Your muscles contract and they stay contracted. Within days to weeks, you get acacia, which is restlessness. Then from weeks to months, you get Parkinsonianism, which is uh, indistinguishable from idiopathic Parkinson's disease. You get the tremor, the cogwheel rigidity, the hypokinesia. This can be treated as well with diphenhydramine or benztropine, um, just like the acute dystonic reaction.
And then in months to years, usually six plus months, you can get tardive dyskinesia, which is a weird hyperkinetic atypical movement of your head, trunk, or limbs. It's often common around your face called perioral tardive dyskinesia. And that's where your tongue, your face, and your lips kind of make a, it's, it's worth looking up on YouTube, tardive dyskinesia of the mouth, perioral tardive dyskinesia. You, you make like a repetitive motion where you're, where you're opening your mouth and puckering and grimacing. Um, interesting to see, but that's what happens. That's an extra pyramidal side effect after using the typical antipsychotics for a long time. These, uh, this tardive dyskinesia can then uh, be reduced or, or uh, be treated by either switching from a first generation antipsychotic to a second generation antipsychotic. And if you're already on a second generation antipsychotic, specifically switching to clozapine, which is uh, one, of this, one of the second generation antipsychotics that's particularly potent. So this is kind of the time course of the extra pyramidal side effects. Um, that are that are all resulting from D2 blockade on the negro striatal pathway. One mnemonic to help you remember these in order of kind of the progress in which they appear are the underlined letters on the slide. So adapt, A-D-A-P-T. You can kind of kind of look at that. That might help you remember the progression of the extra pyramidal side effects. Another major side effect is neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Neuroleptics, of course, are uh, another name for antipsychotics. So this is a malignant syndrome resulting from using neuroleptics. This is an idiosyncratic reaction presenting with confusion, vital signs, autonomic instability, hyperparexia or high fever, rhabdomyolysis, which causes myoglobinuria, renal failure, and cardiovascular collapse. So it's, it's pretty urgent. <laughs> Mnemonic here is fever. So, of course, you present with fever. You present with encephalopathy. You present with unstable vitals, high blood pressure, high heart rate. Your enzymes increase. Things aren't looking good in the blood. And you have rigidity of the muscles. This uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome often presents with, uh, or often presents similarly to um, malignant hyperthermia, and it might be worth looking up a table to help you differentiate between those. Um, nonetheless, it's important to distinguish that you have NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, because it has a specific treatment of dantrolene. So again, don't confuse that with malignant hyperthermia. They often look the same. They both have high fevers, um, and, and they, the, the drugs that bring them on are a little different. Um, it al it's also commonly confused with serotonin syndrome too, which also has the high fever and some of the, some of the autonomic instabilities. So it's, it's worth being able to differentiate between those. And lastly, we're going to talk about the atypical or second generation antipsychotics. These are drugs that either end in apine, idone, and then there's the irregular aripreprazole. <clears throat> so here's the list of them. You can read through them, acenapine, clozapine, olanzapine, they all end in apine, idone, or azole. Apine, idone, or azole. And if we go back to the first generation antipsychotics, we can be reminded that those were haloperidol and ending in azine. So contrast azine from the first generation antipsychotics with the second generation antipsychotics, which end in apine and idone. So A-Z-I-N-E is first gen, A-P-I-N-E is second gen. So there's your list. Mechanism of action here are that they have weaker dopamine antagonism, but they're also agonists of serotonin, specifically the 5-H-T-2-A receptor. Indications here are schizophrenia, and they've been shown to work for both positive and negative symptoms. Side effects here are delayed cardiac induction, as we said last time, prolonged QT, risk of torsades, which can progress to VTAC and VFib. There's less anticholinergic and EPS effects here, so um, that's why I explained those earlier. You also have metabolic syndrome here as a side effect, which is your typical weight gain, diabetes, high lipid count, um, and those are specific to the apines, to the ones that end in A-P-I-N-E. A granulocytosis is a serious side effect of clozapine, and it's kind of a trade-off. Clozapine is probably the most potent antipsychotic, um, the, the most effective at reducing psychosis, but it does have a serious side effect of agranulocytosis. So you constantly have to be doing blood counts and looking at the leukocyte level, um, looking at neutrophils in particular, because if neutrophils drop, that's a sign of agranulocytosis, very serious side effect of a drug that's otherwise very useful. So high risk, high reward for clozapine. And lastly, you also see hyperprolactinemia with risperidone.